I am queen of everything in this part of town. I am queen of the city, and queen of the towers, and queen of the small little wriggly things. And everyone who looks at me says, oh, she is such a wonderful queen. And not ever embarrassing at all, and so normal, and goes to a school. There's nothing to worry about, except... Ah, but I am the queen of evil, and I must warn you, you cannot escape my cunning use of black magic markers. I like Mirror Mask, so I did something stupid and read its reviews. You know, to see if there was some detail I overlooked or an interpretation I'd never considered before. And it went about as well as expected. Meaning, I devolved into a masochistic rage spiral fueled by curiosity and the belief that it couldn't possibly get any worse. You're adorable. Confronted with article after article of misquotes, unfair comparisons, and utter lack of understanding, I decided to fling myself at the source material and see if there wasn't a new light I couldn't shine on this old... ish... movie. To start with, Mirror Mask focuses on a teenage circus performer named Helena, who's tired of fulfilling her dad's dream and wants to live her own. As a result, she shirks her duty, sasses her mom, and is an overall obnoxious teenager until said mom becomes deathly ill. Then she takes to being a doting daughter, visiting her mother and bringing her hand-drawn cards and fruit and the like to atone for whatever hand she may have played in this event. It's during this heartfelt love fest that we get the first bit of foreshadowing in a Longfellow quote. She had a little girl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. The devil's in the detail, my friends. As a result of being off the road, Helena sees what life is like without her mother, which doesn't paint a very flattering picture of her father, as he flounders to manage a business, return hospital calls, and be a parent to a teen whose mother and manager are sick. A plight that Helena seems pretty unsympathetic about, but she's still processing herself, and a part of that process comes in the form of a dream. And this is where we run into a lot of problems with the critics. In the dream, Helena meets a masked man named Valentine, who helps her out of a sticky situation, and in return, she volunteers to be his juggler. Read what you will into that. Anywho, a lot of folks seem to be fleeing in the face of this encroaching shadow when Helena gets arrested. Brought before the Prime Minister, a plot point is revealed. A charm has been stolen, and presumably the balance between these two opposing queendoms will be restored if it's returned. Again, we see a familiar face paralleling the condition similar to Helena's own mother. So, Helena says she'll get the charm, and the story gets a quest availing us to both character and world development. It is while Helena's talking to a pair of floating giants in the midst of an attack that she's given a ton of information, like a key, a place to start looking, and the name of the charm itself. Surprise! It's Mirror Mask. Unfortunately, one of the giants succumbs to the black sludge, and the other just sort of floats off, giving us this visual metaphor for Helena's parents. <laughs> The story continues with Helena and Valentine finding the high ground, shaped like the key, where they run into a bunch of flying monkeys. Fortunately, they're rendered differently enough not to get sued and have the added benefit of names. Not that any of this matters before they are once again under attack. Luckily, a few escape to take Helena and Valentine to where the mirror mask is. Smack dab in the middle of the two queendoms. Now, before I continue, I think it's important to know that Helena's dream is based off the drawings hanging in her room. So, when she looks out of a window facing said space, she can see into it where the Shadow Princess has taken over her body and life. So, while Helena is pondering where the mirror mask is, Helena Two Point Bitch picks up the Dome of Drawers and plops it right in the middle of the Shadow Queen's territory. And if that wasn't bad enough, Valentine then betrays her to the Shadow Queen, after which she becomes the Queen's daughter in what many have called a Quay's brother ripoff. I prefer homage because Dave McKean's Not an Idiot and The Street of Crocodiles is fairly well known in artistic circles, but where the Quays brothers were trying to encapsulate Bruno Schultz's short story about what it means to be alive, this is a transitional, meaning it adds nothing to the plot other than to show Helena's transformation from this pajama-wearing ragamuffin to the Queen's daughter, and when she doesn't cooperate, the tailor dummies sedate her with glitter, paint her up, and redress her anyway while singing The Carpenters Close to You. It is fantastically possessive and completely controlling, but not necessarily threatening. After all, the dummies are just agents of the queen who is Helena's mother, or more accurately, her shadow part. Hmm. It'll do. Segway into Jungian psychology here. It would be the easiest thing to look at the imagery and say this is a straightforward good versus evil tale, but delve deeper and it's not. According to Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, the psyche can be broken down further than Freud's id ego superego model. So, just how much further? Well, instead of three, there are five archetypes. First off, we have the ego, 
which is what you consciously have access to, like memory or active thought, and everything else falls into the realm of the unconscious, starting with anima or animus, which is the opposing male-female aspects of whatever gender you identify as. So if you're female, your animus is male, and if you're male, your anima is female. The rigid gender roles of the 20th century really didn't account for anything more substantial like we have today. Moving on, however, is the shadow self, which consists of the things that we reject about ourselves, like deep desires, primal instincts, jealousies, etc., etc. You know, the things that we morally wag our finger at and say, shame on you two, before we try and temper them with our better angels. Then we have the self, which is the sum of everything else, including the persona, which surprise, surprise, means mask in Latin. That is, the act that we put on in front of other people. And we do put on acts, all of us, whether it's at work, with family, friends, or strangers, we all behave a little differently depending upon who we're with. Hopefully you're getting where I'm going with this because the ego is Helena, the shadow self is the princess, the persona is the mirror mask, and the self is what she becomes when she unites all of them via individuation aka the dream itself. The animus isn't there because it doesn't matter, at least not to the story. But if you want to make the argument for it being Valentine, be my guest. I won't simply because I see him as the romantic interest and not the male part of Helena's psyche. So if this was the purpose of the plot, then why include the shadow mother at all? Well, subplot mostly. I mean, this is a coming of age story after all, and what kind is ever complete without a familial authoritarian figure for the protagonist to rebel against? There's no I am not shot! You're gonna be the death of me. I wish I was. The contempt Helena holds for her mother at the beginning of the film is redefined when she is forced to live as a shadow princess. Confronted with everything she thought her mother was, Helena finally realizes her mom isn't an overbearing monster, and that the mirror mask was never about helping the queen. Why? Because her mom isn't the ruler here. She is. And when you're an adult, you can't rely on your parents to save your world when you're the one destroying it. So when Helena finally realizes that, she's ready to reunite the pieces of herself and wake up. It's an ambitious subject matter, and unfortunately, a lot of it does get bogged down or lost in the visuals. Which makes sense. McKean is a well-known comic book artist, and the benefit of that medium is a reader can spend as much time as they want examining a panel or page. With a movie, it's the director who dictates the pacing. Not only that, but they have the last say in what gets added or removed from a set. Meaning, there's a lot of background detail maybe too much, and we're so busy looking at everything else that we're more likely to miss what's important. Still, credit where credit is due, and a lot of it needs to be given to the cast, Stephanie Leonidas especially, whom working with a digital backlot makes the world and its characters seem real. Which brings me to the visuals. Simply put, they're a product of a small budget, as in direct-to-DVD small. $4 million tops. And I'm not going to even argue the possibilities of them using practical effects because, despite the name, they're anything but in terms of finances. Which brings me to my biggest pet peeve, where criticism from critics is concerned. Measuring this film against Goliath like The Wizard of Oz and Alice in Wonderland is not only unfair, it's ignorant. This movie was commissioned by a studio to make a fantasy film in the same vein as Labyrinth, and it succeeded. Given more time and a larger budget, maybe it could have produced something more worthy of the pedestal we place its predecessors, but given what it is, it's stunning. Not perfect, but well worth the $10 Target prices it at. So if you're looking for a fantasy film where the hero isn't stupidly altruistic or the villain isn't pointlessly evil, I say give Mirror Mask a chance. It just might surprise you. Or not if you're watching this review. God damn it.